everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thanks, everybody, for being here. My name is Ben Doyle. I'm the um, chair of the Montpelier Commission for Recovery and Resilience. I really appreciate everybody coming out. And um, you know, we got a lot to talk about tonight. Um, but before we do, I think it's important just to kind of um, ground this work in what's happening this week uh, with people down in Florida, North Carolina. You know, it's a really unfortunate reminder that these are the kinds of things that are going to keep happening. And, um, you know, for what it's worth, I, I actually some folks reached out to us last week from Asheville to be like, what are you doing in Montpelier? What does that look like? And, um, you know, and I said, we're, we're figuring it out. <laughs> but it's, it's a reminder that this stuff is going to keep on happening and that we're in it together, not just here in Montpelier, but um, across our country. And so I just want to acknowledge what they're going through, and, um, and I'm sure that you share the sentiment that we're thinking of them. But I want to thank you all for being here tonight. Um, my job is very brief, is to remind folks, as we do at these forums, what is this commission? Where did it come from? What is it doing? Uh, and so you'll remember that after the July 2023 flood, there was a series of public conversations about how are we going to try to recover from this event and how are we going to try to prepare for the next one, which we know is going to happen. And as a result of that, uh, the Montpelier, Montpelier Alive, the Montpelier Foundation, the city of Montpelier, um, convened a 15-member commission of people with a variety of expertise uh, and points of view um, to work on this issue together. And the role of the commission, you know, we're not a, a public body. We have no official authority. We're just folks that really care about Montpelier and are trying to work for good things to happen. So what we do in our capacity is we listen, uh, we advocate, we connect dots, we convene people, we try to catalyze things to move towards action. And, you know, um, some of our stuff is pretty visible. You know, we've been fighting for f almost 460 days for a post office to sell stamps in our capital city. And as of that this week, they're doing it. You know, I want to I want to make sure everybody understands that we're going to continue to work with the Postal Service to ensure that they provide adequate services to our capital city. The journey is not over, but we're really appreciative um, that they're back open. And I also just want to acknowledge the congressional delegation and the attorney general who helped make that happen. Um, but most of our work is actually kind of like happening behind the scenes. And we're, we're working in three kind of bucket areas. Um, watershed, the kind of a watershed approach to uh, resiliency and adaptation, knowing that um, flooding doesn't just happen spontaneously in Montpelier. It's a whole watershed relationship that we need to be thinking about and fostering. Um, and uh, the other one, adaptive downtown, thinking about how do we harden the infrastructure in our downtown? Uh, how do we prepare for the next flood? And then the next one is emergency response and preparedness. Um, maybe I'll just talk very briefly about what's happening in each of these areas. In terms of watershed, um, some of the things that we're doing is actually working with um, the Central Vermont Recovery Officer, Pat Moulton, uh, at the Agency of Administration to work on convening, actually, uh, communities up and down the watershed with the help of the Regional Planning Commission to start to think about where are there shared opportunities for investment in projects that will impact flooding all the way downstream and upstream. Uh, and then also, I think many of you might have heard about our project that we're working on, um, the Five Home Farmway parcel down by Agway, looking at that as a floodplain reconnection project that hopefully serves as a model for other parcels in the area or along the watershed um, to do the same kind of thing. That project's in process in terms of the pre-development of the uh, engineering for the project that hopefully will be implemented um, in the coming years. And then uh, in terms of adaptive downtown, you know, we're working um, really like coordinating with entities like buildings and general services at the state, private landowners, the city, thinking about public space, private space, how it's utilized, how can it be utilized most effectively for resilience, but also working, um, one of our projects is to try and do a downtown building survey so that each property owner can have a roadmap for what flood mitigation practices look like, resiliency projects look like for their building, and trying to do this on a wider scale than just individual haphazard. Um, and then uh, in terms of preparedness and response, that's really what brings us here tonight. This is a project that many of us in the commission have been working really hard on, and I just want to acknowledge those folks, you know who you are, that have met, at, what, every Friday for the last six months to work on this and have done some 
incredible work. And I'm going to let uh, Ricarda, our co uh, our co chair, um, speak about more about that. But I would just offer one final thought about this. This is a draft plan, uh, and um, you know we're in a high school, and I. I there was a time in my life when I was actually a high school English teacher. Thankfully, I'm not anymore. But I do remember teaching students about writing and saying that great writing never happens in the first draft. You might have some good writing, but the great writing happens in draft two, draft three, draft four. And no one person writes this plan. All of us are the authors of this plan. We're all going to read it, study it, revise it, work on it together. And that really um, begins tonight. And so I just appreciate you folks showing up and um, you know, getting out your pencils, asking hard questions, giving your great thoughts, and um, look forward to the conversation and the next steps. So Ricarda, it's all yours. All right, thanks Mark. Our tech whiz. Well, I wanted to start off um, with a brief personal story tonight. During the flood of July 2023, I was at the UVM Children's Hospital with our youngest son who was at the start of a two week stay there as he healed from a ruptured appendix. So I watched the flood unfold from Burlington via texts and calls from family and friends and I watched social media as our beloved Montpelier um, filled with water. It wasn't until a couple of days after the flood that I was able to take a bit of a break from hospital life and come back to Montpelier for a few hours. I'll never forget driving into the city that day, the, the smell of, of rot, the belongings of homes and businesses piled up like soggy garbage on the sidewalks, and the army of people at the hub, at businesses, at homes, everywhere. I pulled into my driveway and saw a group of five people, two friends and three total strangers, piling up the wet boxes and memories turned debris from the basement of my in-laws' home next door. At my door, I was met with a meal for my family and two extra fans for drying out our flooded basement. There is no doubt you've showed up, Montpelier. You showed up for each, each other big time. There was no lack of care and love from this community. It was everywhere. Oops, forgot that I was doing that. But in the early days of recovery, through public forums and through our early meetings as a commission, it was clear that while there was no lack of community care, two important pieces in flood response needed work. Clarity of roles and communication. It was clear we needed a more robust new plan for a coordinated emergency response. So the commission, led by the Emergency Response and Preparedness Working Group, began the process, knowing that we had a lot of work ahead. We were just at the beginning. Can you turn the microphone closer to your face? Okay, thank you. Is that better? Okay. We prioritized this work, fundraised for and hired AC Disaster Consulting, or ACDC, with a talented team of people with a vast knowledge base of emergency management in Vermont as a partner in building this new emergency management plan. The goal and the challenge was to write a plan that was inclusive of both the city's official response and the broader community response as well. With this challenge, we quickly encountered what I like to refer as the cauliflower effect. You're probably wondering why that's up there. Imagine you are walking the aisles of Shaw's or the co-op and you see cauliflower pizza crust, cauliflower pasta, cauliflower crackers, tortilla chips, even, I gasped at this one, cauliflower cookies. I have to admit, I kinda, I kinda bought into that, and I saw on Instagram a recipe for a um, 
using frozen cauliflower to make an orange sherbet um, shake. And so I just, I got my ingredients together, I put that together, and the promise was I would not taste the cauliflower, it would taste like orange sherbet. And when I gave it a taste, my, my first and last sip, um, I could only imagine what dirty socks might taste like. <laughs> and it was in that moment that I realized we're asking too much of cauliflower. It's really tasty when it's simple. A little olive oil, a little salt, roast it up. And similarly, we quickly realized as a commission that the vision for the Montpelier Action Plan for Local Emergency, or MAPLE, as that vision grew, we would have to be diligently monitoring our scope and scale. There were so many community needs apparent in the response and recovery space, and Montpelier couldn't be everything to everyone, but we needed it to serve its main purpose really well. Again, it had to have a robust communication plan to enact, enact during a disaster with a clarity of roles, and it needed to be inclusive of both the city's official response and the broader community response as well the latter of which we realized was forging new territory from the more traditional local emergency management plan. So cl oops, clarity of roles and responsibilities is a key function of this plan and why it is so important to have you all here, the community understanding and buy-in. That way we can clearly understand where we as community members need to step up and where we can rely on our city officials. Our process included reviewing existing documents with our consultants, meeting with our city partners, and meeting with many engaged stakeholders. Through this process, we continued to practice the fine balancing act of the cauliflower effect. As needs and gaps were identified, we asked, does this belong in Maple, or will this be a separate, though linked, effort outside of this plan? So with our consultants, we crafted a gap analysis, identifying where holes in disaster response and communications, where there were holes, and a rec recommendations report to review with stakeholders and partners, and both of which would then inform the draft plan itself. And this, I think I might be one step behind, sorry. This brings us to where we are now. Um, the Montpelier Action Plan for Local Emergency, MAPLE, for which I will hand it off to Mark Gwynn, fellow commission member, um, who may or may not talk about cruciferous vegetables. <laughs> Thanks, Ricarda. Can everybody hear me? All right, great. Um, so, I've been tasked with trying to outline for everyone what our process looks like and where we are in that process. We just get together, so, all right, now I know what I'm looking at, thanks. Um, I think the best way to do that is to talk about this graphic. When we set out to figure out what, out, what, the, what the process was going to look like, we started, as many might be tempted to do, with a straight line with a beginning and an end. And the beginning of that was the flooding last year. And the end was some magical day when everybody in the community feels confident that they have a plan for when this, this sort of thing happens again. They know what they can count on other people for, and they know what other people will count on them for, right? And many of us came here today maybe hoping that today was gonna be that day. We were at the end of that line, and here we are. But as Ben mentioned, we're at the beginning of that. So, Going back to the graphic, I'd like to point out that what Ricardo was just talking about is this part that has happened before the diamond. And what we find in here is many small fragments and many gaps in between those things. And through the work that we've done with AC Disaster Consulting and the city, we have begun to identify who the partners are, who the pieces are, who, the, who, is, who are the communities that have needs, and 
Who are the partnerships and the relationships that are going to be needed to pull this thing off successfully? We've also managed to plant the beginning seeds of what those relationships and partnerships are going to look like. Now, to talk about the next part of what comes next, I want to talk just for a minute about National Fire Prevention Week, which happens to be October 6th through 12th, and that happens to be happening right now. So some of you are probably familiar with, at some point you've seen a coloring book or a workbook that a child has brought home from school that says, hey, let's talk about fire prevention and fire safety. Now what is not in that coloring book is the location of your fire extinguishers, your smoke detectors. What is not in there is the conversation you need to have with your kids about how to get out in the event of a fire, where to meet up, who to call, et cetera, et cetera. What is in that coloring book is a list of holes for you to fill with detail. Conversation starters to work out the specifics of your individual fire safety plan. I want us to think of this draft of this draft plan of Maple as a coloring book like that with a lot of details left to be filled in, a lot of good conversations already identified, and a lot of good ideas in there for us. So looking forward at the next few phases of what's coming, this is what John Copans is going to talk about in a, in a few minutes. You'll notice that those fragments become fewer and more connected, and the gaps between those fragments become fewer as well. Eventually, we approach something that looks like a continuous line. We'll note also that it is not a straight line. Not every piece of this puzzle is going to progress at the same pace or have the same types of challenges. So some parts of it will come into focus faster than others, and some will take a little bit longer. Where are we going to wind up? Well, I'd like to say we're going to wind up at some magic day where everyone in the community has this confidence that they know what is up. They have a plan for what they're going to do, how they can help others, how others can help them, and on and on. And I do think we will, we will reach something that is close to that. However, it is not going to be some depot where we get off the train and then wait for 15 days, weeks, months, years, who knows how long, until we need to use those muscles. It is going to be an endless cycle of constant preparedness, continued training, and continuous learning, refining, and improvement of this plan. And interacting with each other as community members, not in emergency, will keep our muscles in shape and ready to react when there is an emergency. So some of the things that John is going to touch on that are very important to all of us and me personally are planning the workshops that will help each of us work out our individual plans, planning how to organize at the neighborhood level. The city itself, internally, each department will have their own coloring book that they need to color in to get everything ready. And the emergency management director, whoever that person officially winds up being, will be really instrumental in making sure that all of those pieces come together, stay together, and can continue working. So to recap, going back to front, where we're headed is an eventual feeling of confidence that is kept alive and strengthened by continuous improvement and continuous exercise. Prior to that is the work that we're beginning tonight with each of you here to give us feedback on what is good about the plan? What is not good enough about the plan? What do we need to improve upon? And we're going to need leaders, and we're going to need leadership, and that's you. That's, thank you for showing up. Thank you for being leaders in the community by being here, and thank you for signing up, as John's gonna plug these sign-up sheets a little later, to be leaders going forward for us. So the next thing before John talks about that is talking about the plan itself and what it contains in terms in form of an operational overview of what's in the plan. Everybody did read the 65 pages before coming tonight, right? Great, thank you very much. In case you didn't, the too long didn't read version is gonna be presented by our new fire chief, Derek Libby, and Montpelier Alive Executive Director, Katie Trout. So I'll turn it over to you guys.
Thanks, Mark. As Mark said, my name is Derek Libby. I'm honored to be the new fire chief, and it's a pleasure to be here tonight to speak with you. Katie and I are going to give a brief overview of the operational aspects of the plan. Uh, the plan itself, this section is pretty in depth in it. We're doing a breakout session about the operational aspects, so this is a mile high view of it with more detail in the breakout section if that's of interest to you or if you read that section and have questions. So. So where we're at now, uh, you know, with emergency management and the plan starting off with monitoring and activation and what does monitoring look like? Pre-event, pre looking at weather reports, um, tr trends, um, collecting and analyzing information from a variety of sources, whether it's the weather department or people in the field that are observing things, um, community groups, individuals, um, and city employees or non-city employees and taking that information and analyzing what it means and how in the past it's affected us and uh, what other patterns we're seeing in the, in the region. Um, like I said, that comes from a variety of sources and then it's the emergency management team's responsibility to analyze that information and make some decisions that are spelled out through the uh, operations section of the plan. And then consider uh, you know, activation of the emergency operations center and also considering when you activate the emergency operations center, activating the volunteer hub. And not every time that you activate an EOC will a volunteer hub become activated because there are times that EOCs become stood up for planned events or minor events that don't have a, com a huge impact. And we'll look at the uh, incident levels. Um, there are three incident levels and then at the end of it is a decision when to deactivate the EOC or when to make it smaller. EOCs are modular, so you can make them as big as you need to or as small as they need to to effectively respond to the, to the incident at hand. I'm not sure how well the red's showing up there with the, with the lighting, but like I said, there's three levels in the sections that I've highlighted in red. Um, level one is a minor or localized incident quickly resolved with the existing community uh, resources and limited outside help. So a typical structure fire that it stays with the building of origin, um, you know, maybe a little bit of mutual aid in there, but it's not a long drawn out incident. Um, a level two event is more significant event or threat that requires a response by more than one department or response agency due to special or unusual characteristics. Um, and then it's a partial implementation of the emergency operation plan. Not all aspects of the, of the plan are, are activated. So that would be a partial activation. And then a level three event would be a significant disaster or imminent threat um, based on what, uh, what observations we've had before the event that you could stand up early. Um, wide range of impacts such as those requiring evacuation and sheltering of residents. So as we go through the three events, you know, it's incumbent upon the emergency management team to evaluate the information that's coming in and make educated decisions about how that's impacted us in the past and what it looks like for a short-term or a long-term event. The emergency operations center positions and duties. Um, like I said, this is a brief overview, so there's a lot more duties and responsibilities, but the emergency operation director is kind of the overall incident commander of the, of the emergency operation center. The public information officer, um, vetting information that's coming in, preparing press releases or information to the public. Um, and it's really that person's taking information in and with a group of, uh, within the city government looking at making sure that the information is accurate. You know, many times during a, during a response, there's good information and there's bad information and trying to clarify what's not right or what, and then uh, having a constant accurate um, press, 
release to the groups, to the community. The planning section, um, planning section chief's responsibility is to look at what's been happening, taking situation reports and planning for the next operational period or the next day and how, how the city, how the community is going to re react to what the needs are. Um, logistics section brings uh, support and services to the EOC, whether it's standing up the EOC, making sure that there's communication capabilities, um, computers, Wi-Fi, if not, pens and paper, and all those things to, to keep moving forward. Um, the finance section we'll talk more about, but really allowing for, with the authority from the city, allowing for emergency spending, but also importantly is the documentation of personnel and resources that have been activated and keeping track of hours of a piece of equipment being used, hours of a truck being utilized for response. The number of personnel hours are tracked and when that becomes important is if it becomes a Stafford Act, it becomes reimbursable expenses. And without the forethought early on into the incident, there's a great potential of losing all that or taking a lot more time to recreate the uh, accurate information. And then the operations section is responsible for all those emergency support functions on the, on the side of the screen, um, admin and communications, infrastructure, economic development, community resources, emergency assistance, and public safety. So if you look at it, what it looks like as an organizational chart, like I said, the emergency operations director at the top, and the city council and mayor, the public information officer, the different section chiefs, and underneath the operations section of those areas that report back up. So in incident command, there's, it's scalable, so you fill the positions that are needed, but also it's linear, so people report across or up to their person, and it's not jumping around and communication going all over the place, so it really manages the communication flow and who you answer to. So uh, the next section in, or a section in the emergency plan focuses on the volunteer hub and operations, as many of you remember or participated in. Um, the volunteer hub coordinates volunteer and donation activities before, during, and after disasters. So um, last December, you might remember that the volunteer hub popped up just before or during the threat of flooding um, and during and after as we did last summer. Uh, the city has the backbone responsibility of supporting the volunteer hub, coordinating with the EOC and community partners such as Montpelier Live, long-term recovery group, um, and uh, to meet the community needs. Key responsibilities. Uh, would include volunteer recruitment and training, donation tracking, and public communications um, by working with those community partners as well. All right, roles and responsibilities. Everyone that's got a role in the plan has a role in responsibility, whether it's in preparedness, response, or short-term recovery as this plan covers. Um, you know, in preparedness, the volunteer hub could be activated to help with filling sandbags and distribution of sandbags and stuff like that. Um, the key functions of the emergency management team doing training and exercises leading up to an event so that we're prepared to fill our roles and, and staff that, um, identifying people who are going to fill those roles and making sure that they have the requisite training and experience to, to fill it. Um, and then the businesses and the public doing checklists and making sure that you have a plan for an emergency. Um, where are your documents? What's your continuity of operation and things like that. Um, during response, 
you know, depending on the situation that drives what the response looks like and how those roles and responsibilities are, are taken. Um, but within that emergency management team in the org chart that I showed you, it drives who has the responsibility for what sections. And then the short-term recovery, making sure that needs are identified, um, that communication occurs, and that those needs, those unmet needs, are addressed, whether it's power, water in your basement, whatever those unneeds may, unmet needs may be, is making sure that there's a system in place to identify them, to report them, and to activate people or to, tools and equipment to meet those needs. You know, in the slide you see the city personnel and elect elected officials. Each of these people, along with the key partners and secondary partners, all have responsibilities throughout the plan. Um, again, this is brief, but you know, making sure that we're all engaged in it and that the, the personnel are prepared for it. Um, you know, for financial department, making sure that we have forms in place and tracking methods established so that we know how to document time and material usage. Department heads making sure there's continuity of operations. Many of the roles within the plan are delegated to department heads. So who's your number two, number three person within your department to make sure that the police department still operates while the chief has a role in the plan? And same for me that you know the fire department still responds to emergencies that would happen any day while I'm in the um, uh, operations center. In city financial management, you know, emergency expenditures, um, documentation of disaster related expenses, again, those timesheets to track personnel used for the emergency, um, vehicles and equipment utilized and documenting hours that those vehicles are utilized for the event. Um, the FEMA, has a specific guidelines as to what is uh, recoverable expenses. So keeping track of, keeping up to date of what that looks like, but also having the systems in place ahead of time so you know that in 2024, this is what they're looking for. 2025, it could be a different methodology as to how you track usage. So being familiar with what that is. Uh, documentation of, by photos and geolocation of public infrastructure damage. Emergency repairs that happen, making sure that that's photographed before it happens, before the repairs happen, so that that work is recoverable. Um, showing the damage, the pre-event, the damaged event, and then the, what the emergency repairs look like. And then obviously keeping receipts to, to uh, validate what the expenses are. Within the plan, it identifies shelters, um, regional shelters that are, the American Red Cross stands up at the uh, direction of Vermont Emergency Management um, with an overnight capacity and then currently local shelters with warming and cooling centers. Um, communications, is that you guys? <laughs> Just to chime in here. Um, the Communications Crisis Response Team, referred to as CCRT, um, is made up of city personnel, official communications functions of the city, um, and is activated when the EOC is activated. Um, internal city communications monitors situational awareness and um, is responsible for intelligence gathering and common operating, developing a common operating picture among the response agencies. Uh, VT Alert is used for emergency notifications with uh, established thresh thresholds for different events. And other communications channels include the city website, social media, press releases, uh, and communications uh, given through the community partners such as Montpelier Alive, Kellogg Hubbard Library to get information out, out to the community. So like was mentioned, the CCRT 
is made up of city personnel um, identified ahead of time as to a person from each department that is in the field and able to or is able to receive information from the field and process it and you work as a team to create communications about current situations they're taking in situation reports which becomes important in the planning phase for the next operational period so it's really the liaison between the field and the emergency operations center for communicating and bringing together situational awareness to drive the plans and then also uh, working with partners and resources um, contracts that the city may have in place ahead of time other local resources um, and then state of vermont resources being able to reach out for uh, hazardous materials response team urban search and rescue and swift water rescue teams uh, teams like the state police or their special teams um, community emergency response teams and the red cross to meet unmet needs and then a section in the plan talks about vulnerable populations um, identified as unhoused young elderly or access and functional needs in the plan identifies the several organizations and facilities that serve the vulnerable populations and how to work with communicating with vulnerable populations and making sure that they're reached out to and that the official communications are reaching the people that may have challenges and getting them through mainstreams. Um, back to you. John. <laughs> Uh, I'm John Copans. I'm the director of the commission, the staff person for the commission. Really want to appreciate you all for coming out tonight. Uh, really want to thank uh, all the presenters, but uh, let's give a little acknowledgement to uh, Chief Libby. He's literally been on the job two months, uh, and he's thrown himself into this work with this Maple Plan. It's been really great, great to have him. So really want to You know, and, and while we're saying thank you, I want to just say thank you. I don't know if anyone's here from Montpelier High School, but we really appreciate them for sharing this facility and supporting us here. And the other thing I want to acknowledge is Orca Media. Uh, we have such a treasure in, in Orca. They're here, they show up, they've got a whole team here, and without them, uh, participation is so much harder. So really appreciate uh, Orca being here. You know, um, I think Mark already gave you a little preview in, in, in terms of what, I, what I'm going to cover. It's really about how do we move forward from here. Tonight is, is clearly a pivotal moment where we are uh, really eager to, to get input from you all and, uh, and, and feedback on, on this draft plan. But we also want to set some milestones for additional work that we're going to do. So I want to just describe that quickly. And then we need to really get into breakout sessions so that we can hear from you. So let me do that uh, with, with some haste. So you've seen that chart. Mark did a good job of describing that for you. <coughs> You know, one thing we're going to do with this plan is fill in some detail. I'll give you an example. We know that the volunteer hub is essential in terms of that short-term response, but the truth is we've got more work to do. I see Suzanne from our long-term recovery group, the Montpelier Disaster Recovery Network. We know Montpelier Alive is really important in supporting the hub, and the city is important. We have more conversations to do to get together with those key players and to figure out things like, you know what's important? when you're tracking volunteers is a, a software system for making sure you're connecting those volunteers to the right opportunities and you're, you're essentially developing the tools to recruit and, and retain those volunteers because they are a real asset for the community. So that's some of the detail that we need to, uh, to provide to this plan. Another example is uh, really working with our por partner organizations to better define how they fit into Maple and what they will be doing on their own. You know, for example, I was talking to folks at the Kellogg Hubbard Library, uh, or I was talking uh, to one of our local uh, churches, and they were talking about having their own emergency management plan and how that emergency management plan really links with the city's communication system. So we need to really define what are those points of intersection 
intersection uh, and work with those community organizations to build those relationships and in some cases really define that with, a, with something formal like a memorandum of understanding that really provides clarity of roles for both the city and the community organizations in terms of who does what. Another piece is, uh, is really working with the community around checklists. Uh, we've talked about this for businesses and for residents. What does it look like to have a, an emergency pre preparedness plan for your home or for your business? You, uh, having a go bag, having those documents. And, and, and what our expectation and hope is, is that we're gonna pull together some workshops in the community so that we can get trained up and in fact, We've, um, oh, I'm, yep. We've got a sign-up sheet for folks who want to get involved in planning those workshops. So if you're interested in helping us do that work, uh, we've got uh, a link on our, on our Maple webpage. We've also got a paper sign-up sheet at the welcome table. Please sign up to do that work with us. Uh, oops, I've skipped to a next slide here. Uh, Another uh, piece of work that we're going to do is around neighborhood level organizations. This is one of those topics that we have heard consistently from the community is there is a sense of the power of being organized at the neighborhood level. That might be around communications. That might be because it creates a vehicle for us to look after our neighbors and to make sure we're taking care of one another. And we have not answered the question in this plan about how we want to design that neighborhood network. Of course, it, we know it's been done in the past. We need to learn from what's been done in the past. And so, in fact, we want to convene another conversation around neighborhood level organizations. It's our intention to do that in, uh, in early November, in fact, uh, November 7th at Three o'clock, I'm doing that from memory. I thought I had it on the slide, but uh, pay, please sign up if you're interested in that conversation and we will be back in touch with you about, about neighborhood, neighborhood level organization. And finally, uh, I wanna acknowledge our, uh, our new long-term recovery group, uh, the Montpelier Disaster Recovery Network. This is a really important part of our human infrastructure when it comes to emergency and responding to emergency. Uh, Suzanne is sitting in the back and is uh, really in a leadership role with, uh, with the long-term recovery group. My uh, encouragement to you all is if anyone is interested in joining in that effort, uh, they are sort of at a, I would say, a, a nascent or a, a beginning stage and really looking for community members who want to step in and be partners in that work. It's really important to have a vibrant and healthy long-term recovery group as we think about uh, facing uh, future, future emergencies. All right, so I think it's time to start hearing from you. You've done a lot of listening, and thank you for bearing with us. You know, um, before I send us to the breakouts, we are uh, a city of bridges in Montpelier. In fact, I think we're starting to really uh, embrace that, that identity as the city of bridges. And I like to think of this Maple Plan as in fact trying to build a bridge, a bridge between the municipality and the community when it comes to emergency response. What you've heard a lot today is about uh, that the detail of what the city's roles and responsibilities are when it comes to community response, but the reality is, or when it comes to emergency response, but the reality is we all have a role to play, uh, whether that is as residents in this community, as parents, as business owners, as employees, in all of the different ways we are community members, we can be thinking about this. And, uh, our breakout conversations are really, I think, designed to try to, to, try to focus in on some of those areas. And so, uh, let me give you a little sense of what we're doing now. All right, so we've got three breakout groups. The first one is around community-based response. That one is actually just staying right here in the auditorium. So if you're interested in that one, stay here. The second one is around communications. That one is just going right down the hall to room 101. And then finally, 
Uh, if you're interested in the operational plan and sort of the more formal city roles and responsibilities, that conversation is going to be down the hall in room 102. So uh, if folks want to, I think we're ready to move on to that, that section. We're going to come back here very quickly at 815 for a quick wrap up. We'll do a report out, but I would encourage you uh, to move quickly into those breakouts so we can get those conversations going. Thanks. I know we're all having wonderful one-on-one, one-on-four -on -one, one -on small conversations about these topics. Don't forget whatever it is you're saying, because it's important, but please take a seat. We're going to try and, I need to be louder. Oh, hand off the mic and no one gets hurt. Got it. Okay. All right. Um, folks, thank you again for coming this evening. My name is Nathan Souter. I'm a resident. I'm a member of the commission. And I love nights like this where we get to hear from other people. Uh, I was the facilitator in the operations room. And so that meant I got to hang out with Chief Libby and with Tori. Tori, who is one of the authors of the plan, and Chief Libby, who has been a major contributor and will continue to work on these ideas. Um, John told me I have three minutes, and I'm probably down to 2.45, so I'm going to be quick. Uh, probably my f one of the things I liked about our session was there are a lot of people in our community who are thinking about this constantly in, with a great level of specificity, and um, in case we were sort of losing touch and not using enough imagination, we have North Carolina in Asheville as a very concrete example of what could happen in an even more severe flood to remind us that this is quite real. Um, some of the ideas that I thought were really cool that I just want to highlight, and I'm going to rip through them. They're not organized in themes. Um, we've heard about tracking expenses for FEMA. What about tracking the needs that people are having? Um, we heard about redundancy within both, uh, as we heard in the, in the initial presentation, sort of who's in charge of what, what about their second in command? Uh, and then that's a little bit in tension with one contact so that if eight of us need help getting stuff out of the basement of our stores, uh, eight of us aren't calling eight different people and asking for help. There's one point of contact who, who coordinates that. Uh, I mentioned the, the imagination or lack of imagination in, in North Carolina in the recent storm is uh, a reminder that it could be much worse and we could have way fewer systems still functioning and we need to be really cognizant of that. Uh, again, uh, you heard a little bit about uh, uh, shelters for in emergencies and the, the, the Barry Auditorium and uh, places here in town. And this is one of these areas where the city can control property that the city controls, so the senior center. Well, what about the college or what about the middle school? And so I think it may, there may be a role for the commission or some other body to, to bring a number of people to the table who have control over those spaces and think about whether, you know, in what situations we could use those as shelter. And then it got as specific as, okay, if, you're, if there are going to be people in the middle school, is there a closet full of, say, water bottles and snacks that might be necessary because we could be prepared for that. Um, what about an evacuation plan? Back in 1992, apparently the high school students were supposed to evacuate to National Life. That was an ice dam. Uh, what about kids in the other schools? What happens if there are literal geographic barriers to that? Um, back to shelters. Uh, some of the shelter effects are because the Red Cross uh, has been a provider of shelter. And the question is sort of, does the Red Cross need to be the one managing that? Turns out the Red Cross uh, does shelter trainings for people like you and me. You can do it online. Uh, and we're going to have to because that's gonna, that kind of thing is going to have to be stood up by locals. Uh, the Red Cross is not coming in like the cavalry. Um, down to, again, redundancy. You know, if the police uh, operations have moved to another site, but their phone lines don't reach them, so you're trying to get on the phone to call for help because you can see someone in distress, ideally that will continue to work. What if those centers of uh, organization don't have power? Again, redundancy. A point that we can have our plan here in Montpelier, but what about networking with regional plans and regional groups? Because uh, anything of any real scale is going to affect communities near us. Um, there are resources from the feds for paying for food and other basic human needs in situations like this. Let's make sure that we can access those funds. 
Uh, English language learners are, are folks who, for whom English is not the first language. Let's ensure that we have an idea of how to provide translation and interpretation services. Um, there's a great story about back in 92, we, apparently the city had a system of you know, three whistles would mean people on Elm Street should evacuate, and five whistles would mean a different neighborhood. So really sort of uh, you know, almost smoke signals level, like if everything, if all the electronics are out, what could still work? Um, and then neighborhood associations that could help check in on neighbors well before an emergency, you know, um, Mark, have you scanned your documents to the cloud in case everything you own gets wiped out and you still need to have a birth certificate? So we could all check on each other well in advance of emergencies. Okay, thank you for those contributions and I'm handing it off to Ricardo. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? All right, so I was part of the communications portion of the plan and um, we, Nathan mentioned a lot in, in the group he was in about communications and so some of this will be reiterated so I'll be quick but one thing I did want to note that we talked about in the beginning was this new um, guide from the city, it's a flood, flood level guide. Um, we have them out there and it's a great resource to get information on what is it, what do flood stages mean, what, what do I need to do in each stage. So that's a great resource. And then um, there were suggestions about having one place for all the alerts to go. There are so many different channels to share information, Facebook, um, uh, you know, websites, et cetera, but to have one spot where somebody can go and know that they can get the latest information. And we talked about having that as the, on the city website and um, currently there's a carousel at the bottom with information but having during a disaster having it front and center not not scrolling down to the bottom um, creating a culture of readiness in blue sky days with good communications um, how are we communicating when the power is out? That was a big question that we discussed and um, would like to, folks would like to see a little more robust information in the plan of physical ways to get um, alerts. Neighborhood plans, hub, et cetera. Um, the timing of communications is really important. Some people felt like they'd like to have the communications more frequently. Um, clarity of language is important. Is this helpful? Is it clear? Is this a, um, words that people can understand and not have misinformation be spread from um, misunderstanding terms? Um, articulated communication plans with schools using good old fashioned radio as a communication um, tool. And lastly, the importance of having road closure notifications and a suggestion was for the city to sign up for a Waze app and um, to put that in the plan as well. All right, that's it. Um, our group talked about community level organizing and some of the themes that came up were that it will be very important for us to determine the size of what a neighborhood means and the number of neighborhoods is very critical. If they're too big, that's no good. If they're too small, it's also not, not good. So how we define those neighborhoods is gonna be really critical. We also talked about shelters. Um, there's, there, there was a lot of discussion about, about the shelters. I'm not sure that that's in, inside the control of the neighborhood level organizing, but uh, it, was a, it was an important part. Um, we recognize that there is going to need, need to be some form of central organization or leadership, regardless of how many neighborhoods there are and how the, how the, how the smaller blocks are organized. Um, and one of the key functions that the, that the neighborhood level organizing will serve is to fill in those communication gaps. Whether, it is, whether it's for people who don't communicate with the same language, don't use the same types of technology, aren't able to receive messages in whatever method VT alert gets them to them, that neighbors helping neighbors and neighbors knowing which neighbors need help is going to be really critical for that. 
And then the last thing I'll say is that something that I said to the group at the end, which was that I was really encouraged by the conversations that we had because one, what we're hearing people say we need from the community outside of the commission is in line with the conversations we're having inside the commission. So it's personally, it's, it's sort of affirming that we're not way off base, that we do, that I mean, we're part of this community and that we, we basically understand what it is that we need as a community. And two, um, I want to leave us with this, this idea that was brought up by um, a young man, I say he's young because he's younger than me, um, who said he has the luxury of having strong legs that he can use to walk uphill to get away from whatever it is. And I think we all agreed as a group that it is incumbent on those who have the luxury of strong legs to carry the rest of us who don't have that same luxury uphill with us. Um, I think that's it. That's, that's, that's all we do. Anything I missed there, Katie? John, do you want to close us out? Ben Doyle is going to close out. I want to thank everybody for coming. This is a really terrific night. Thanks, Ben. Um, I'll be very brief. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks to the folks that facilitated those conversations or reported out. I have just a couple other thank yous that I want to say thanks to. I'm just looking at the city staff that worked a really long day and are here tonight. And I just, uh, I want to just say that, look, we really appreciate it. All that you do every day and what you're doing today, what you've done for us and what you will do. And I just want to acknowledge all of you. I want to thank the commission members too. You know, uh, I can't tell you how many times we've had these like ridiculous three hour long meetings and people walk out of there and say, actually, I'm more energized after the meeting than I was before the meeting, which doesn't happen often. They're a really wonderful group of inspired people that are working really hard. Um, but most of all, I want to just thank all of you that came out, all of you that are on Zoom, all that are here in the room tonight. You showed up uh, for community the day after the flood and you're showing up for your community now with that kind of same spirit. And in that spirit, here's the sign-up sheet. <laughs> There's more in the back. You can, uh, you know, we all had heard incredible ideas tonight. Let's put them into action and let's make sure that those ideas are represented in the plan. And then the last thing I'm just going to say is I'm, I'm always wary of sports metaphors and I'm sorry to do this, but, you know, it strikes me that the plan that we have is just the plan. It's the game plan. It's not the game, right? And when I watch football, very rarely, it's not the touchdowns that I love. My favorite moment in a football game is just before it starts when the punter puts their finger, is it the punter, the kicker, whatever, the kicker, puts their finger in the air just before they kick because the game hasn't happened yet. They have the plan but the energy in that moment to execute the plan is real. And that's where we are right now. We have a plan. It needs work. This isn't a game. This is real. But the finger's in the air, and it's like, let's go. Let's, let's go do it. So that's my sports metaphor. Thanks so much for coming out and for your hard work.